Welcome everyone to this edition of the Verifiability Talk. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Matt Windsor. Uh, Matt has got his uh, bachelor and PhD from York, and uh, then he moved on to be a postdoctoral research associate uh, on uh, the Verifiability Node, but also in the RoboStar project, uh, working with uh, Anna. And she will be talking about uh, RoboCert, the specification language for robotics, which was developed in, in the RoboStar project and in the verifiability node, and also on the uh, case study that we worked uh, on together. So, Matt, thank you very much for having accepted our invitation, and the floor is, the floor is yours. Before we start the, the talk, the talk is being recorded. It will be posted on YouTube. So if you don't want to appear in the YouTube uh, recording, you can turn off your camera and join as a guest. Thank you again, Matt. Uh, please go ahead. OK, so um, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm Matt and uh, I feel like I'm a little bit of a disadvantage today because I'm starting the, the talk um, having been already uh, upstaged to some degree by another speech that has been um, made um, previously in the day that has been taking quite a lot of people's attention. But I shall say no more about that. Um, I'm here talking about um, RoboCert, which is a um, a notation that we're currently working on for um, the property specification of um, robotic software systems and eventually hopefully um, other forms of robotic system as well. So um, the general format of the talk is going to be as follows. Um, firstly, I'm going to be uh, talking about what RoboStar is, the, uh, the group in um, which I'm a member as well as the verifiability node. Um, I'm then going to be talking about the particular goal that I want to be solving or that we want to be solving with RoboCert. And um, then um, I would talk about RoboCert, but um, to start off with, I need to just uh, make a quick detour into a bit of um, background knowledge um, with regards to one of the other notations that um, we have in the RoboStar ecosystem, which is called RoboChart, and that's our notation for uh, design um, modeling, um, modeling of robot software design. Um, robot system designs that's that's a bit of a sort of conglomeration of words and um, then finally they'll talk about RoboCert give an example um, and uh, then say what the next steps are um, I've, I'm just a little bit aware that my my iPad is slightly leaking audio so uh, please let me know if that's causing an issue um, firstly though I'm going to talk about uh, RoboStar and RoboStar is a center of excellence in software engineering for robotics. And uh, what does that mean? Well, it's a, a network effectively of um, lots of different um, subgroups of people working in the area. Um, I'm from York. I'm working in the, the York group, but we also have various um, sites both within the UK and also without. So um, we have colleagues in Sheffield, sorry, King's College, um, uh, more. Um, we have uh, collaborators in um, the industry as well with um, quite a few in um, Tireless as well. And then we also have um, people working in Norway, Germany, France, China, Brazil, and further afield. So um, one of the key things that we've been working on is this idea of a um, set of interrelated and uh, coherent notations for um, software engineering for robotics. Um, I'm going to be talking about RoboChart, which is, uh, you could say that's the flagship notation, or at least the one of the oldest and um, most um, established notations that we have, which is for software designs. But we also have a notation for um, simulation, which is um, at a lower level than RoboChart. That's called RoboSim. Um, there is work being done by my colleagues in, in RoboStar on a notation for architectures called RoboArch. Um, there's also work on 
a notation based on uh, controlled natural language for stating operational conditions of um, robot usage called Robo World. And it's into this ecosystem that the work on Robosa is um, effectively um, becoming part of, and this is going to be the uh, the property notation um, for um, complementing these other notations. So um, why do we have so many notations? Well, one of the things that we're trying to do is um, reach a middle ground between um, two possible extremes, I guess, of um, how one might um, reason about or um, create documentation for robotic systems. So um, on the one hand, you have um, informal diagrams and um, informal English and um, things that have been written without necessarily there being a semantics in place or a meta model or anything for that level of structure. Um, and this is quite often the case with the sorts of notations that uh, roboticists use in practice. Um, but the results tend to be ambiguous, of course, because there isn't this um, widely um, understood unambiguous meaning behind these diagrams and um, these uh, notations. And also, I say the word inflexible here. What I mean, really, because you might, you could say that, of course, diagrams in English are very flexible. What I mean is that um, it's not so easy to take these things and put them through um, an automated process. You can't really easily compile English down into a um, uh, something that can be model checked or something that can be turned into code um, without having a, a an expert in the loop, probably the person who wrote the um, English or the diagrams to begin with. Um, on the other hand, we have mathematics. Uh, mathematics, of course, being very useful. Um, and of course, um, we want people to use mathematics in some form at some point down the line because it's useful for things like proof. Um, having these sorts of formal methods and these formal systems is also useful for automatically generating um, artifacts and uh, having a lack of ambiguity. But um, we have this problem where the sorts of notations that we're going to have um, in the mathematical world aren't necessarily useful for upselling to roboticists who aren't trained with, um, say, CSP or um, TLA or any of these forms of um, rigorous notation. So that's where RoboStar is trying to find a happy medium where we have these notations that are meeting people um, at the level of diagrammatic notation and um, controlled natural language where it looks like and is similar to what they're currently using, but has the added ability to be um, amenable to translation down into serious mathematics or has this backing of serious mathematics that um, can be used for um, all the things that we want to use mathematics for. And the end conclusion of where we're going with this is model based software engineering. So um, we want to be able to have a fully end to end process whereby um, roboticists are going to write a model or um, draw up a model that has and captures the design that they have for the software of their, um, their robot. And then also specify in this natural language that has a, a, a formal meaning, the operational assumptions that they're making. And then we, we can lead them through this um, process whereby they get a simulation data model which can be combined with a physical model of the um, the robot and a scenario model and then we'll get the 
um, deployable code and simulation artifact as a process, as or, sorry, as a uh, end product of this process, instead of having <clears throat> the situation where we have a model and we have code and they go out for sync, and there's a gap between um, what the code is doing and what the design is supposed to be doing. And one of the things we're really passionate about is trying to capture assumptions and make all of these things traceable and um, directly related and thereby reduce what we call the reality gap, which is um, this gap between what people intended their robot design to be like um, in the design and specification part, and then um, the gap between that and what they get out of its behavior in a real scenario. So that's RoboStar um, in a nutshell. With all of that in mind, what's the goal of RoboCert? Well, the goal of RoboCert is that we want to be describing properties of these robots. And um, this obviously complements the robot design and all of the various things that we're deriving from that because it's um, part of the um, world of trying to specify around this model what this model should be doing um, and um, having conversations about the model. So um, if we're trying to describe properties of robots, um, we want to ask three questions really. Firstly, what kinds of property are we interested in describing? Secondly, what use cases do we have for these properties? Why are we interested in having the properties in the first place? And thirdly, which parts of the robot software are we going to have properties on? So firstly, I'd just like to address the question of uh, what kinds of property are we going to be putting into this RoboCert um, notation? Because this will um, influence what the notation looks like and what it needs to have as its feature set. So firstly, the most straightforward and basic kind of property that we might want to reason about with our um, hypothetical property language is something occurs. And in this case, we have this, this uh, property, the robot turns. And we may want to be able to say with this property, that it's always the case that a robot will turn at some point during its um, operation, or maybe it's possible for the robot to turn, or maybe we want to negate that and say the robot can't possibly turn, or it, there are situations where it doesn't. And this is sounding contrived um, with this example, and that's kind of hinting that maybe a language that only talks about occurrences of individual things or sequences of things isn't going to capture anywhere near the uh, breadth and depth of properties that we want to have in this property language. So what other things do we need to be able to say? Well, it would be nice to be able to say when something happens, then something else happens. Or in this case, when an obstacle is detected, then the robot turns. So there's this implicit um, idea of being able to allow the robot to have any sort of behavior until something that we're interested in happens. And then immediately we sort of override that and say, OK, now here is what the robot is going to do in response to that stimulus. So um, this sort of causality property um, it turned out when I was starting to look at um, possible um, case studies that we'd already done, um, that already had properties, this came up quite a bit. And so one of the first things that I wanted to do for RoboCert was to capture this um, in as um, efficient a way as possible. This is already starting to look like a realistic property of something that would be, say, a obstacle avoidance controller in a robot. But there's something missing here. Um, and the thing that is missing, um, put it this way, um, when the obstacle happens, we haven't said when the robot turns. 
And you could take the most pessimistic approach here and say, well, when the obstacle happens, then it is perfectly possible for the robot to wait until any amount of time, including any amount of time after it's smashed into the obstacle, then it suddenly starts turning. And that's not useful at all because that's not telling us anything about an obstacle avoidance um, algorithm other than um, it, 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 it tries at some point, maybe. So we need to be able to specify times properties. And the first thing that comes to mind here is that we need some way of specifying deadlines. So when the obstacle is detected, then we might want to say that the robot immediately turns or more specifically, more accurately, the robot immediately begins turning. And that's an improvement because now we have this reasonable um, idea that it will react. Um, it won't just indefinitely prolong this reaction. Um, but we may have now made the property too specific or too unrealistic because we haven't factored in the possibility that the robot might detect the obstacle but then have to have some sort of reaction time before it can turn and so what we need here is the ability to encode budgets the ability for there to be an amount of time that we build into the reaction um, so a lower bound instead of an upper bound, perhaps. So we also need the ability to specify budgets. Um, so here we have when an obstacle is detected after one second, then it immediately turns. And this is the sort of property that we want to be able to capture in RoboCert. So having talked about the sorts of properties that we're looking at, what sort of use cases do we have for properties? Because this is also going to influence language as well. Because the most obvious use cases maybe for properties are either verification or testing, depending on which side of the verification versus testing um, debate um, you're on, or, or both if you're on, on both sides. Um, runtime monitoring is another use case that we might be interested in. But also something that we really need to be aware of is that these properties are important for discussing and understanding the, ro the uh, robot models as well. And the properties themselves need to be discussed and understood. When we were talking about the properties in the firefighting UAV, um, which I, 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 I do regret, I haven't um mentioned in this slide deck but would be happy to talk about um in the in the questions but um for the firefighting uav for instance we have been doing a lot of discussion on the properties which are specified at the moment in english and you get the idea there that english is a good substrate for discussing the properties it's not a very good substrate for verifying the properties and we need a happy medium with the property language where we can understand the properties even better if it removes the ambiguities of English in the process. Um, but it's also amenable to verification, testing and eventually monitoring as well. So those are use cases. Um, another thing that I've already mentioned previously, but falls under the idea of use cases, is um, what positions we want a property to be um, used in. So there's this idea that a property can be existential or universal. Um, it, it can be observed or it holds in all cases. But properties can also be positive or negative. We can observe them or we can never observe them. We can hold them or we can prove that they cannot hold. Or in the case of the turning robot, the robot sometimes or never turns or the robot always or doesn't always turn. And we want to be able to capture all of these in the language as well um, for maximum expressivity. So that's use cases. Uh, finally, I want to talk about what 
parts of robots we're interested in having properties over. And this is um, idealistic um, because um, some of this is related to future work. Um, but um, the idea is that obviously we want to be talking about software. We want to reason about software with properties. Um, that's the most obvious part of the robot that we could reason about. We might also want to reason about parts of the hardware, say if it's a custom build um, or we, we're not entirely sure about the hardware. Um, we want to check parts of the hardware to make sure that they behave the way that we expect them to behave. Um, we eventually will want to be reasoning about a combination of the software and the hardware as well. And this is where a notion that RoboStars notations have comes into play called the uh, robotic platform, which is the idea that the software and the hardware aren't directly um, modeled as connected to each other, but instead go through a well-defined interface of services that are provided by the hardware to the software. So that's events um, that represent sensors, for instance, operators that represent actuators, shared variables, and so on. And once we have this combination of software and hardware, then we can have a um, series of properties that are targeting the entire robotic system as a whole. And here we would likely be saying, well, this thing goes into the um, the sensors of the robot and this thing comes out of the actuators of the robot. And obviously the software is doing something inside that and the hardware is doing something inside that, but it's all abstracted away within the um, software, sorry, the robot system. And even more interestingly, perhaps, is if we want to reason not just about the system as an isolated unit, but also the system in the context of a particular scenario. So we might want to say, um, this is what happens with the robots of obstacle avoidance um, system when there's an obstacle positioned five meters away from the robot. That would be a scenario um, level um, thing, something in the scenario that would maybe form part of a an existential property. So these are all things that we want to eventually build into RoboCert. Though for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be talking primarily about the software and maybe the platform, which are um, the parts that are able to be modeled using RoboChart. Um, and that segues into the next bit of the talk, which is where I'm going to be just talking about RoboChart um, enough to form the background of um, the next bit on RoboCert. So, RoboChart, if people haven't come across RoboChart before, is a graphical notation for um, design models of robot software. And it's very much inspired by um, UML style state machines, um, box diagrams, the sorts of things that um, practitioners use either um, informally or maybe in the case of things like UML, maybe they use um, routinely, but there's not a particular formal semantics based um, approach. Um, and that's what RoboChart was really designed to give people this um, very formalized uh, notation with a well-defined meaning and um, at the same time, an intuitive front end. So um, I probably don't need to go into much detail about what these diagrams are all telling you, other than there are lots of different levels of diagram all corresponding to multiple different levels of a component hierarchy that gradually go down from specifying the software um, as a whole in relation to its platform 
um, and we also model the platform in RoboChart as well, all the way down through controllers, uh, which are groups of um, software functionality, to individual state machines, which, as you can see in the bottom right, are indeed um, created through state diagrams with transitions, initial and final states, and so on. And this RoboChart component model is um, very important to the design of RoboCert in ways that I'll come back to later. Um, it's this idea that we have state machines and operations that form controllers that together form a module that then um, accesses the services provided by the hardware in the form of this robotic platform abstraction. So why do we have RoboChart? Well, the use cases for RoboChart are very similar to the use cases for um, having a property um, language such as uh, RoboCert in that we inherently want to be using both as two sides of a verification setup or two sides of a setup where we're discussing or understanding a robot system. Um, for RoboChart, we also have this idea that we can generate artifacts from the RoboChart model, eventually by translating through to RoboSim, um, which is our simulation notation, and then creating um, simulation artifacts in S SDF and other such notations, and eventually also extracting code um, in C or Rust or um, targeting ROS and so on. So we're going to focus primarily on verification in this talk, not just for RoboChart, but also for RoboCert. And that's because that's the area that I've mainly been focusing on for RoboCert at the moment. And the main verification approach that we use for RoboChart is a refinement one where we have a RoboChart model on one side. You could think of it as an implementation, but it's really a model of an implementation. Um, we have a specification on the other, and we are going to be seeing whether the implementation, in quotes, um, satisfies the specification, i.e. its behaviors are a subset of the specification. If it's a, say, a universal specification, if it's a type that says that um, all of the behaviors have to obey this, um, this pattern, this behavior set, or effectively the converse if the specification is existential, i.e. Um, there has to be some behaviors in the RoboChart model that satisfy this, um, this pattern. So that's our strategy. How we do it with RoboChart is we um, use a tool called RoboTool to um, effectively compile RoboChart to another mathematical language for um, that is well used for um, refinement verification. And specifically, importantly, because we have this need to specify timing properties, we need a language that supports time. Because it's software, we can get away with the idea of time being discrete, which is very useful. Um, once we start putting hardware in the loop, then things become inherently continuous time. Um, and um, then we have to uh, rethink the strategy a little bit. But because we're in the discrete world here, we can use a, a notation called TOXESP which is a process algebra um, which supports refinement. It's um, been around for quite a long time, or at least CSP itself has been. Um, Talk CSP is an extension of CSP that adds discrete time as a special form of event called TOC. And TOC literally represents one unit of time passing. And it's a very um, intuitive and um, elegant way of encoding time um, as um, as an addition to um, something that was originally 
based around the idea of um, composing processes in sequence and parallel with communication and um, recursion. So um, until fairly recently, at least, the verification story for RoboChart using ToxiSP looked very much like this, where we had RoboChart, we had RoboTool, which automatically generated some ToxiSP, and then we'd have this refinement relationship embodied by a model checker called FDR4, which would take in ToxiSP in that implementation position and do the refinement um, under some sort of semantic model, but it would then need some CSP on the other side to represent the specification. And because we didn't really have a high level language for, spe for representing um, most properties, so properties that aren't things like is deadlock free or is deterministic, those sorts of core properties, Anything else um, would need to be written directly as a specification in ToxiSP. And going back to the previous slide, um, as you can probably see, this is a the sort of notation that is very much geared towards um, people with a background in um, formal methods and the mathematics of computer science, and not so much geared towards roboticists. And so um, this sort of notation was um, not palatable. Um, it, it wasn't realistic to expect um, roboticists to be on board with it. So um, the ideal situation here would be, well, we need this property language um, called RoboCert. RoboCert will sit here in this position and it will be a sort of like perfect partner to things like RoboChart in the RoboTool will carry both of them down to ToxiSP and then we'll have this nice symmetric behavior where um, we, we lower both sides and feed it into FDR. And then we get an added bonus of flexibility here because eventually RoboCert will maybe be extended to support other notations um, inherently um, using this high level language. Um, so that's the ideal of RoboCert, and that follows us on to the next part of the talk, which is actually me talking about RoboCert. So RoboCert, I'm just going to check my time, is a multimodal notation for properties of robots. By multimodal, I mean as in it has various different subnotations. Um, I may be slightly cheating here because I'm counting ToxiSP as one of them because RoboCert allows you to just escape into ToxiSP and you can use FDR to do, verica do verification the way it used to be done. Um, there's a controlled natural language that um, has been imported from work by um, my other colleagues in, uh, in RoboStar for properties such as is deterministic, is live lock free, is deadlock free, and so on. There's some work by um, Randall Ye um, et al. Um, on doing probabilistic reasoning using PRISM and the PCTL language, which um, targets an older version of RoboCert and um, future work is to integrate that into the version that I'm working on. And this talk is going to be about sequence diagrams. There's a reason I showed sequence diagrams several slides ago, and this is the reason. Because um, the main high level notation that we're using is based heavily on UML2 sequence diagrams. So it has all of the various features such as parallel composition, looping, alternative choice, optionality. But it's also um, refined that's probably not the best word to use. It's it's augmented to um, refer very tightly or correspond very tightly to this RoboChart component model that I mentioned earlier with modules, controllers, state machines, operations. And because it's a sequence diagram with the possibility of multiple lifelines, we allow this idea of having 
um, a property over multiple controllers in a module or multiple state machines in a controller as well. But we also have a few extensions as well. We have deadlines and budgets to capture the ideas that I was mentioning earlier. We have um, experiments in liveness modality. Um, we're borrowing something from life sequence charts um, called the temperature modality, which um, I'll talk about briefly if I have time. And we have um, any until, which is a way of encoding the uh, we don't really care about things that are happening until something happens, in which case we expect this to happen, which I mentioned um, in the set of properties that I was talking about earlier. And we also finally have um, a notion of in specification memory. So um, being able to say we saw an event that carried across a, a value, we call the value X. Later on, we see an event and we expect it to send X plus one back for instance. So use cases for RoboCert are naturally the use cases for properties. Um, I just wanted to bring this back and say um, testing and runtime monitoring are things that are in my head as possible use cases for RoboCert, although they are to be explored um, in the medium to long term. Um, verification is going to be against ToxiSP because that's what we're uh, really targeting with RoboChart. And of course, this discussion and understanding is going to be very important for RoboCert as well, especially with things like the firefighting UAV case study. So um, I've got a motivating example here. Um, this is the one that I have been using in a, um, a, a paper that was recently submitted and accepted for ICFEM, which is next week. Um, this is an obstacle avoidance um, similar to what I was talking about earlier. Um, the idea of this is you wait for um, a warning of an obstacle, then turn with an angular velocity. The angular velocity we don't really care about, but we give it the constant turn speed. We then wait for some turn radius divided by turn speed time units. Turn radius would li likely be pi if we're working in radians or 180 if we're working in degrees. Then we stop turning and then repeat. And one property that we might want to capture, i.e. a behavior set that we might want to see in this um, particular motivating example might be that we receive a warning of an obstacle as the first thing that happens. We immediately turn with any angular velocity. Um, there's a point here to be made that if a property is existential in RoboCert and we have this any, then we must observe it over all possible values of that any. So we'd have to, this expands to checking for immediately turning with velocity zero, one, two, and so on and so forth. We then wait one time unit and immediately stop turning. And as a RoboCert sequence diagram, it looks like this, which hopefully is fairly intuitive. Um, there are a few things that I'll just discuss because they're somewhat peculiar to RoboCert, but the general scheme of that sequence diagram is that it is a sequence diagram um, that's communicating with what looks like a formal gate if you're used to the UML um, terminology. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about is the top, which is saying the sequence diagram is named turn turn. And then you'll notice in brackets state machine avoid. This is a RoboCertism that represents the fact that this um, sequence diagram is targeting a state machine in the RoboChart component model called avoid. Targets can either be single components. Remember that those are modules, controllers, state machines and operations or subcomponents thereof, um, i.e. you could say that a target is components of controller blah. And that would mean that the sequence diagram, instead of being one lifeline representing, the, in this case, the state machine, it would be multiple lifelines representing all of the state machines of that, com that controller. 
And the diagram edge, the right hand side edge that you saw things going to and coming from, is what we call the world. And that represents all of the components that are outside this target. So all the state machines that are inside the same controller, all the other controllers, the robotic platform, and so on. Um, further down, we have this here, which is um, a message. It's carrying a RoboChart operation. So RoboChart has operations, events, and shared variable reads and writes. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> As its main forms of communication, we currently support operations and events. Um, and here you can see that we have this little protrusion on the left hand side. Excuse me again. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, protrusion that says zero. This means that there is a deadline of zero time units. It's very similar to a UML duration constraint in informal meaning, but formally speaking, it corresponds to the RoboChart discrete time semantics. So it's a, a, a deadline rather than a um, full duration constraint. And in CSP, it corresponds to this, um, which um, I, I don't think there'll be many CSP experts in the uh, virtual room, but the idea is that um, <coughs> it's being compiled down automatically to <coughs> CSP where um, messages become events, we introduce this cold thing, which is this cold and hot modality that I'll talk about later. Um, <coughs> deadlines become an interesting construct um, in ToxCSP where um, we have this uh, wait for um, whatever amount of time units followed by you stop, which is saying um, we stop allowing any more time to progress. So <coughs> it's an interesting concert that basically means after zero time units, no more time can progress. It's a deadline. It's a hard deadline. Um, weights encode budgets, and it's a discrete number of time units. The notation is this, subject to change. Um, they just become weights in ToxCSP, and a weight for n units is effectively a sequence of n instances of the TOC event, which represents a discrete passage of time. Oh. Um, the sequence diagram here automatically gets compiled down into um, CSP the module some reformatting and renaming looks very much like the CSP on the right hand side. And um, oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and um, so you can hopefully see that whilst in the grand CSP scheme of things, the CSP on the right hand side is not um, the most hairy or complicated CSP. It's still not something that you would expect roboticists to enjoy reading um, unless they like CSP, which um, I, I imagine some do, but um, not the majority. So we're hoping that the sequence diagrams are going to be more uh, palatable. Um, I'll just do another time check. Um, yeah, I think um, I'll be very brief. Temperature is a, a, a notion where we're trying to add a layer of liveness where um, events can either be cold, i.e. they can be indefinitely put off by the model. It can just instead go, um, I'm waiting arbitrary amount of time and then I'll engage in the message event. Uh, whereas hot messages must be accepted urgently if the environment is willing to um, to engage in the message. Um, the default is cold modality. And then we have this any until which is encoding causality. 
where we have the, uh, the ability to wrap a part of a sequence in a any until block. It has two parts and any part which has a set of messages and any message in the, that set can occur until something happens in the until block, at which point the until block immediately takes control. And that's how we encode things like that. If obstacle then um, turn from earlier. So um, we also have this distinction between properties and assertions. And we do that for the reasons I mentioned previously. So we can have properties in all sorts of different use cases and positions. And um, we make the same distinction that I made earlier between existential, universal, positive, and negative in the assertion language. So the assertion language looks like this. And it translates fairly directly to um, the input language of FDR, which is CSPM. Um, effectively, these become refinements in various different directions. And um, in conclusion, what we're doing here with RoboCert is we're trying to get this happy medium between ToxiSP, useful for proof, hard to sell to roboticists, and UML and English widely used, we would posit, by roboticists, but um, somewhat ambiguous and um, not uh, amenable to this sort of um, formal verification. So in conclusion, um, RoboCert is the RoboStar property language. We've been working on adding sequence diagrams to capture properties. These sequence diagrams compile down to formalisms such as ToxiSP, um, and uh, we've been working on some small scale um, examples and we're just at the point now where I'm starting to get bug reports from other people. So it, I think it's on the verge of becoming something that gets used um, throughout the RoboStar community. And hopefully the verifiability node community with the case studies going forward. Further work includes adding proper graphical tooling um, I have to admit that the sequence diagrams that you saw here, whilst they correspond to um, a, a reference manual where I've said this thing here has this graphical notation, the actual graphics that you saw here were hand drawn in ticks. Um, we would like to have graphical tooling available to make me not have to do that. We want to reason about hardware and scenarios, as I mentioned previously, which will give us the knock on effect of continuous and dis as well as discrete time. And it would be nice to target other things other than FDR, eventually um, theorem provers such as Isabel UTP, um, as well as continuous, um, continuous time uh, model checkers like Cora. And finally, more case studies such as the verifiability node case studies, of course. Thank you for um, your attention. Um, I'll leave two links up. One is to RoboStar's uh, webpage, where you can learn all about RoboStar and RoboCert. And the other one is to the paper on RoboCert, which has been, which I'll be giving a talk about um, in ICFEM, um, this time thereabouts next week. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, for, so we have um, a few minutes for, we have 10 minutes for questions. Are there any questions? Yes, Thomas, please go ahead. Hi, Matt. Thank you for a very interesting talk. So I just had two questions, I guess, about one quite specifically. Um, in your example, you had both the use of weights and deadlines. Um, where these seem like quite similar concepts. Is is the difference that the weight is saying setting a minimum time limit, whereas the deadline's setting a maximum, or is there something more complex going on there? And my second question was um, if you could elaborate on your uh, discussion of potentially expressing scenarios associated to what scenario triggers a given sequence diagram and if you have any 
concrete ideas for how this could look. Thank you. Okay, so um, yes, so with the deadlines versus uh, budgets, um, there, and this is something that did confuse me quite a bit when I first started. Um, they are complementary ideas. So um, interestingly in UML, they have one type of constraint and that's a duration constraint. And that is saying minimum and maximum time bound. Um, but in RoboChart, you have this idea of um, a budget, which would be you're effectively, I, th I think it's similar in Robo, so you're effectively inserting a, a pause. You're saying, um, I'm allowing this amount of time to pass. Um, I'm, I'm sort of making a um, an allowance for this amount of time to pass. Um, so um, it would effectively, it, it would correspond more to the lower bound side of things. Um, Whereas the deadline is very much the upper bound. It's for saying if it takes longer than this amount of time, then it's not right. There's, something has gone wrong. Um, and um, in the example, so sort of appealing to the CSP semantics of, um, of Robosa, um, weight is, so the budgets, are quite literally we're just inserting a pause into the sequence we're saying um the the sequence is going to allow time to pass here um so that's uh, on the specification side could the um implementation choose not to wait or um so i think if you're doing time-based reasoning, the implementation would also need to wait a corresponding amount of time as well. Um, sorry. Um, so, yeah, there, there, there is there is the possibility of verifying uh, Robo against RoboChart in a way such that you're um, taking time into into account and. Um, in that case, then, if if the specification says um, we wait for three time units and then the model and then do something and then the model does something, um, it waits for four time units or waits for two time units, then you may have a problem. Um, I say may because obviously the um, the specification might also then not have a deadline on something else happening. Um, so it, it, it's a little subtle in that case. Um, it all depends on whether you have how s stringently you're um, defining the time bounds in your uh, specification. Um, but yes, they are um, separate parts of the same um, the same world of timing. Um, the, the robo chart timing model. Um, I feel like I I still I still get caught up on subtleties, which is why I'm being a little bit vague, perhaps. Um, but yeah, I, I I forgot to go to the CSP for this. Um, the the CSP for this uh, might make it a bit um, clear for anyone who knows uh, talk CSP because it's saying. A deadline is literally saying this thing can happen, um, but if T number of time units happens, then time stops. So it's saying there is no possible valid model where this thing can take more than T um, time units. So that's an upper bound. That's That's constraining the upper bound. Um, on your other point about um, scenarios, that's a really good question, and I think we're too early in the in the process to have any designs for that yet. But that is something that I do want to start thinking about very soon, um, because it is going to be where the exciting um, future work is going to lie. Um, and having any any sort of property 
I know the, the firefighting UAV certainly is going to have properties that we can start looking at encoding in idealistic sequence diagrams and from there start talking about what RoboCert could look like. If the, uh, the other um, case studies are similar, then that would be good as well. Yes, definitely. I would be interested to discuss if any of the examples on the RAD case study would say fit this model. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. We have time for one quick question before we close this meeting. Um, I would have one question. Um, so the, the question would be these modalities of existential, universal and positive and negative. Um, you wrap them around the whole sequence diagram, right? Um, I, I'm, is there, I mean, I guess that the reason is maybe because it's easy to translate to the model checker that you have. Uh, but is there anything where you where you see that this might not be enough or where people might want to mix or nest uh, these modalities? Um, so it's without a concrete case study, it's difficult to know. Um, I do know. So you're abs you are absolutely right in pointing out that one of the reasons we do it this way is because um, this sort of separation of property and assertion where the assertion is where you make this modality is something that fits naturally into CSP and into FDR. Um, and it it seems to work well for the sorts of properties that we've been working on uh, previously. But I am aware that um, certainly in the general sequence diagram world, you do tend to get sequence diagrams where you have um, a big, long sequence diagram and then suddenly buried in the middle of the sequence diagram, you have a box that says this is forbidden and it's this specific thing. And maybe where those, I imagine those sorts of properties are, I, I, I conjecture that those sorts of properties can probably be encoded in a in the sort of way that we're we're, we're doing it, but whether they're as succinct, um, probably not. Um, and certainly, um, that's something that might be might be worth revisiting. But as I say, I haven't actually found yet a concrete case study where I've gone, oh, I really wish I had a negate block in the middle of my sequence diagram, um, nor have I thought, I, I don't know how to translate that into uh, into um, this sort of property. Um, another thing is, another thing that I've been thinking about recently is that maybe having it this way makes it more uniform if we want to add other sorts of notation later on so that we have this uniform assertion language where we say all of these properties they hold they don't hold they're observed they're not observed and then the properties could be sequence diagrams activity diagrams csp processes and so on and so forth sorry csp yeah no core assertions over csp processes sorry certainly not csp assertions OK, thank you very much, Matt. I think even the time we can take the rest of the questions offline. Thank you very much again, Matt, for this uh, wonderful talk. Uh, we will have another edition of the Verifiability Talk in two weeks when uh, Nicola Paoletti from uh, King's will uh, give a talk. Um, uh, Nicola is someone who does research in uh, testing and verification of cyber physical systems. He's not part of the node, but uh, he does uh, very much related research, and that's why we have uh, uh, the honor of hosting him next uh, for the next edition. So please do come to the next uh, meeting. Thank you very much for being here, and uh, see you in two weeks' time. Thank you. Bye. How is it going yet? Is everything fine there? Yeah, good. I, I now have uh, two people working with me, so.